Hello, can you hear me? I'm uh, Mircea from uh, Cloudflare, and uh, today I'm going to share you our uh, network automation experience with uh, Salt and Napalm. It's basically how network automation actually really helped us to keep the network stable, reliable, and uh, as you'll see later, self-resilient. Why? Because uh, we are growing, we are already a pretty big uh, network. It's one of the biggest uh, global networks. Uh, and uh, this network carries uh, many HTTP requests every day, billions and also billions of uh, DNS queries, all served from uh, more than 100 Anycast locations globally developed. The biggest challenge was uh, this thing that it is, it is growing. We uh, deploy a new pop about every week. Every week we add a new pop in our network. Besides that, we needed to avoid the human error factor. Everyone have done mistakes. We will forever do. We are not robots. But uh, the machines uh, will never do mistakes. If you instruct them properly, they will never do mistakes. As uh, someone said, they will, in worst case, they will do consistent mistakes that uh, you can uh, correct later. From time to time, we need to replace equipment. And uh, replacing equipment means uh, you take a device from Juniper, for example, and uh, you replace it with a Cisco. And basically, what you need to do is to regenerate a config that does the same but looks totally different, which is not quite fun. We need to monitor our network to know it better and also to recover much faster when uh, an external event outside of our network happens. Based on these challenges we faced in the past, we uh, set a list of uh, requirements for an automation framework. We said we need, it needs to be very scalable to cover the needs of our network as big as it is, uh, to, but not only at that point that was in, uh, when we started automating, but also looking into the future, as the future network will be even bigger. Concurrency, because um, our network engineers are distributed uh, around the world and they need to access the resources of this network independently without uh, overlapping with each other. To be easily to be configured and customizable. Uh, and when I say easy to be configured, means to be easy to be configured by network engineers, not by software engineers. And the framework to be capable to have a level of abstractization that uh, it should not depend at all on the device vendor, to work only with entities of data, not with uh, semi-structured text files or text files that depend on uh, vendor X or Y. To periodically collect statistics and uh, eventually cache some details. Now, first question, why salt? When, uh, if we look in the environment, people use uh, mostly Ansible, Chef, or Puppet. The very basis is the difference between orchestration and automation. With automation, mostly means that uh, you have uh, a Jinja template, you render it, you load it on the device, and pretty much that's it. So basically, if you want to automate, you'll end up running a different manual command. You will still need to do something manual on the CLI. So you replace a manual task with a different manual task. While in orchestration, you can instruct the system to do that for you. You can instruct the system to be intelligent enough to react to events. For example, you have a BGP neighbor that goes down, and the system will know by itself, oh, that neighbor BGP uh, BGP neighbor went down, now I go by myself and I fix it. I will apply this config for you. If you look uh, at, uh, if you draw a line between an orchestration and uh, configuration management uh, framework, I say, the, for example, Ansible, because it's the mostly used, no, doesn't mean uh, necessary that uh, we should always compare them. Uh, Salt comes with uh, lots of uh, features by default, like uh, real-time job, job scheduling, REST API, high availability, encryption and security, uh, 
possibility to pull data from uh, Git or SVN, all for free, or other in other frameworks you need to pay, and uh, most of the time it's tons of money you need to pay. Also, it's about uh, the, and another difference is uh, that you have a long-standing sessions. You open the connection once with the device, and from now on, afterwards, after you open it, it's not closed. It's always kept alive, and when you need some data, it the framework goes and grabs it for you. It's uh, whoever tried, sold, saw how fast it is, it's almost instant. Another argument on our side is particular for us is that we have used it for servers. We've used salt uh, for years and we had very good experience. It's scaled enough to cover needs for multiple thousands of servers around the world managed with salt. And also, if you think about it, having the same tool uh, for servers and uh, network devices is simply great. The other part is uh, the Napalm library. It's basically just a wrapper that uh, allows you to connect uh, to the network device. And uh, it, there are a couple of drivers for uh, Juniper, Cisco, iOS, NXOS, um, what else, iOSXR. Arista, Fortinet, Palo Alto, Pluribus, uh, soon will be also Brocade, and few others. Have mixed them together. <laughs> and um, in the latest uh, release of SoulStack, network automation is uh, embedded by default in the core. So from now on, when you install SoulStack, you have uh, all the features from Napalm in Salt. You only need to use it. Basically, we have reduced uh, the network automation with only two steps, install and use. Just a few examples without going into deeper details. Uh, the point of this presentation is not to, is not, as, is not a tutorial. I won't go into deeper details, just uh, what you can do basically, not, not uh, how you will be able to, uh, to do it. This will be a, would be a different talk. You can uh, execute traceroute on all devices that begin with edge. So basically at the edge of the network you execute uh, the traceroute just doing edge star and then uh, net.traceroute and then destination IP. Uh, or you can uh, apply a different uh, command on a, a group of, uh, of devices and uh, you can uh, structure them uh, depending uh, on your uh, use case. In our case, we group them by uh, region. And we, uh, if we need to disable Tilia now in all Europe, you, we no only need to do salt-capital-N, then Europe. This is the uh, co code for Europe, EU. Then transit.disable and name of the transit. If you notice also the syntax, for, uh, salt forces you to provide a syntax that simply makes sense just looking at it. Or um, the third command, we execute uh, the show version raw CLI command on uh, the CLI of uh, all devices that are running uh, JunoS only. The fourth retrieves the ARP table from all uh, devices running ISXR 602. The fifth retrieves the probes results from all uh, uh, Juniper MX480 routers. The sixth will set a list of uh, NTP peers on all uh, devices whose type is a uh, router. Salt also helped us to have abstracted configurations. So no matter if it's a Juniper device or a Cisco, the config on our side looks the same. And it does not depend on a vendor or something. It's only about entities of data. For a BGP neighbor, you only need to know the IP address, the group eventually, not necessarily, description, remote address, and potentially other features. But as you can see in the right hand side, uh, they do not say it's, this is a Juniper or Cisco or an Arista. What's the gain of doing this? Firstly, you can put your, uh, all your configs in a Git repository and uh, manage them using Git or SVN or whatever. Let's see an, uh, another example. We have an edge router with 1,000 BGP peers. It's manufactured by vendor B, and at some point, 
you need to replace it with a device from vendor B. And this is how most network engineers would look like. Like the green guy is trying hard to bring back up all 1000 BGP sessions manually and uh, not succeeding too much. And this is us. Basically, we need to open a file and edit saying this is not vendor A anymore. From now on, is vendor B. And that's it. Uh, the system works for us now and uh, will configure the device accordingly depend, say, depending on the, their, um, on the vendor or on the, on the platform. Other features we can get uh, is scheduled operations. Is job scheduling and uh, they, uh, the system will run it at specific intervals sometimes um, depending how you instruct it. We run trace routes at the edge of our network every four hours. And it's about only six lines of config saying every four hours go and execute traceroute.collect. And store the results in a Redis at host, localhost port 6379. And now we have a, a big database in Redis with thousands of entries refreshed every four hours. Using either scheduling, either something else we can see, we'll see later. We, have, um, you, we can keep uh, the config uh, updated. So no matter if someone will jump into the device and will apply some changes manually, they'll be corrected by, um, by, the, uh, by the framework. On the left side, you can see how we uh, set those entities of data. and. Uh, as I said before, they do not depend at all on the vendor. It's just about saying ntp.peers and then follows a list of NTP peers. It's just a YAML, it's not saying it's a Cisco or a Juniper. Using the scheduling feature we've seen earlier, we can uh, schedule operations at specific intervals of, of times that will go and will uh, make, the, make sure that the uh, configuration actual on the device is as you expect to be in this file, or doesn't need necessarily to be a file, can be a, a database or anything else. It's just an entity of data that in salt is called pillar. You need to keep in mind this term because we'll reference it later. The function that is scheduled here is uh, called state.sls. What it does, it uh, runs something that is called state. A state makes sure that what you have on the device is exactly what you have in the pillar file. So what is in the pillar file but is not on the device will be added. And uh, what is not in the pillar file, or uh, what is in the pillar file but is not, no, sorry. Uh, what is on the uh, router but uh, is not in the pillar will be removed. So basically, the state will apply only the chunks of config necessary to make sure that you have the, uh, the, the, the configuration exactly as you expect to be. It won't apply anything and they'll uh, expect you, uh, the uh, device will uh, work uh, and, to, and uh, will uh, co compare and will uh, compute the, div, uh, the config div. It applies, uh, it loads only the necessary configurations. I have um, a short uh, recorded demo. It's actually from uh, our production network, but uh, with some uh, details uh, that are not uh, disclosed. There's something else called runners, like this one, net.find. Can you see it properly? Is it okay? Yeah, it's called net.find, and then followed by a specific term, like in this case, cogent, and then uh, comes back pretty fast and says, I found cogent in the, in the description of the following list of interfaces. There are quite a few. Uh, this uh, is a very useful, this tool, to detect where we have um, uh, an interface given uh, uh, circuit reference ID. 
searching uh, using the same tool now, net.find fi uh, followed by the reference ID. It says you have this reference ID in this location on this interface. Again, uh, the same command um, run against the uh, MAC address. We'll go and uh, we'll uh, search it in uh, many possible databases, in uh, MAC tables, in ARP tables, or in uh, LLDP tables, trying to match the chases ID. Uh, also, we'll uh, try to match it with the physical address of uh, some interfaces, and so on. And the IP addresses are not displayed in uh, this case. Uh, it's because uh, it's about our transit networks and we don't want to disclose information like that. And uh, searching for the MAC address, it says I found the MAC address being the physical address of this interface. Oh. We can search also using the interface name and we'll find it, uh, uh, we'll return the details of this interface in these uh, locations, in the uh, LDP details and also the LDP neighbors for that uh, uh, for those interfaces. And also, a very long list uh, of ARP entries. Again, the same tool can be used to s a search for uh, IP addresses. And uh, we'll try to match it also with the IP addresses from, um, of, of, from, uh, from the interfaces. It's not displayed here, but uh, hope you believe me that it is. Uh, this. Um, IP address is within the IP network associated with this interface, and also uh, the uh, ARP entries. How is uh, uh, this useful? Those outputs are uh, nicely displayed on C the CLI, but behind there are objects that can be reused in other tools. A tool that uh, reuses this, in our case, is this one uh, called CFBGP dot push BGP neighbors, and then followed by the remote AS number. What it does, it uh, using a peering DB will determine all possible peering locations between our AS number and the remote AS number. But peering DB doesn't say in uh, this location you need to update this device. It only says uh, in uh, this location you need to use this IP address. Using uh, the tool we've just seen earlier, it's just trivial now to identify what devices we need to configure. And it goes and uh, says uh, you will need to configure this device, in this case is Paris, CDG, and uh, London, LHR. And returns the, uh, diff, uh, the config diff. Uh, some uh, other commands that uh, provide the uh, CLI output and are uh, like more like uh, operation of my ops commands is ntp.peers well, simply goes and uh, retrieves the list of ntp peers as they are configured on the device now let's run uh, something called state we've spoke about this earlier and uh, running it it says I had nothing to do. The peers I are uh, configured as we expect it to be. Let's update the pillar. In this case, is a file. But as I, as I said, there can be also a database, or as you prefer to be, or how you find it safe. Safe. I have removed one peer. I have added a different one. And running the NTP state will make sure that on the device will be exactly as you had uh, as we had in that file as i said the state makes sure you have exactly what is there what is not there is removed what is uh, additional will be uh, what is additional will be removed what it has to be will be added is in this, uh, the state output uh, proves this it says i have added this NTP here i have removed the other one Running again the command to retrieve the list of NDPs, you saw how fast it come back and said we have this NDPs configured. Uh, I yeah can uh, see it. It uh, is different. All right, that was the old recorded demo. Speaking about uh, how it helps us. We've seen some uh, tools that are nice, they help us, 
but uh, the network actually benefits when uh, it's self-resilient. And we've begun monitoring our transit providers. We have installed at the edge of the network thousands of um, RPM or IPSLA probes on Juni Juniper or IO6R devices. How many? About 7,000 probes. And uh, the, their config was generated using only four functions that are already available in a uh, soul stack. They are uh, all uh, embedded. I think it's obvious enough that uh, you can't generate 7,000 probes without having automation. Uh, you can't simply do it manually, not only to provide the, the initial config, but also those probes have to be maintained and then kept up to date, because you need to specify the source IP address and the, the target IP address, so we can force the, the probe to monitor the backbone of the carriers. And, and uh, if a carrier will needs, for some reason, to make some changes, like an uh, interface IP address to be changed, you need to regenerate those probes. So basically, every time this, um, those probes are regenerated, it are a couple of hundreds of probes that are changed. So it's obvious enough, I think, that uh, it needs to be done like that. Manually, it's, you can't do it. How are they installed on device? It's using the same uh, as, uh, similar state. We've seen earlier state.sls router.ntp that managed the configuration for NDP. Something similar is uh, with probes, router.probes is the difference, and uh, a source of truth is a pillar containing a configuration like that. And we have a map of probes globally de de uh, deployed, uh, which continuously monitors the backbone of the internet. How are they retrieved? It's again a truth, uh, different uh, salt function called probes.results and gives back a list uh, of uh, details for, um, for each and every probe, saying uh, the uh, losses and average delay and so on. We have plotted uh, those uh, results from uh, the RPM and IPSLA probes, and uh, this is the image of the internet at least when it's a good day. But usually, uh, the internet looks like that. It's uh, yeah, that is a sad image of the internet. Uh, and it's not uh, only one particular case. We see this almost every day. Uh, we can see transits like this one with purple had the packet loss for uh, about 12 hours, uh, or uh, the pink one for a couple of hours, they had uh, between uh, 60 and 80% packet loss. So basically pay these guys to drop our packets. And this is why we needed to react when uh, something like that, that happens. And uh, SALT plays an essential role in the middle of the network now. We've seen that is used to generate the pro those probes config, to push them on the devices, and also to retrieve those, uh, their results. There's an external consumer called NetPerf. This is uh, particular to us, is uh, not public, but uh, how to see how it um, fits together with SALT. This consumer retrieves the probe results uh, through SALT. And together with other uh, metrics we have, like F uh, 522 errors, interfaces load, uh, or Nagios or Prometheus alerts, and so on, Intelligently will take the decision to disable transits or even the wall anycast in uh, some locations. And uh, those requests will be sent back to SALT. And SALT will go and will apply the necessary configuration changes on the devices. And will say, disable this transit in this location, disable anycast here, and so on. And now we just uh, sit back and enjoy we have uh, this kind of alerts in uh, our HipChat channel. Where it says, Cogent has been disabled in all Europe, uh, Anycast has been disabled in Medellin, or Comcast has been disabled in all North America. How often we see this? I just took a, 
random time wind, uh, window of seven days somewhere back in uh, in October or no, it's, it's September this one, September last year. That proves about 120 changes per day in average, only for this, all without any kind of human intervention. It's another example that proves that without automation we cannot do it uh, enough good. How you need to think about those 120 changes? They are not distributed equally across the 24 hours. It's not like you apply five changes now and uh, five changes the next hour. Uh, most of the time is like 60 changes need to happen now. Otherwise, you will have packet loss and your clients, your uh, customers will um, complain about your the quality of your services. And a human being would not be able to identify where and what to disable. Just think uh, that there uh, are many things to take into consideration. If you disable a transit, and what if the other interfaces do not have the capacity to take uh, all uh, the other traffic, and so on. There are many things to be taken into consideration, and uh, humans cannot do this real time. Now, if you use it, if you want to use it, uh, there are only two steps. You only need to install salt, and the underneath library is called uh, Napalm. There are a couple of examples and uh, how uh, to install instructions on the dedicated repository. If you want to use it and uh, it really helps you, we are glad that we've been able to help. But it would be also nice if you have the power, not necessarily immediately, but in time, to contribute back to those great projects, to Napalm and uh, SALT. If you need any help, or uh, advice, you can uh, join the Slack channels at the Network to Code. Um, and there are two rooms that uh, might interest you. Uh, you can search for Stack and Napalm, or uh, directly contact uh, me or my colleague by uh, email. For the moment, if you have any questions. Any questions? Yes. Um, this is really awesome. So, have you looked at using um, reactors or the Salt Event Bus to give uh, like a data stream or to do more advanced um, remediation workflows? Yes, I see you are familiar with the context. <laughs> yes, we we are using uh, reactors. Yeah, uh, they are more advanced topics. Uh, even so, I've been into too many details for uh, uh, as an intro. But yeah, we definitely use uh, reactors. They are great. <laughs> And this is more, I, actually I will have tomorrow, if you are interested, uh, I've been uh, included uh, in a panel with uh, Juniper and Arista, and I will touch a bit the, uh, the surface of the water uh, with reactors and a bit of orchestration example. Any other question, comment, suggestions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have Eddie, uh, he will talk about uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, cache enabled server resiliency. It's a great sock. Thank you. Uh, um, let's see here. So if we want to uh, use quicker. Uh, I can just use, use uh, uh, oh yeah, or just to use uh, as a pointer. We can see yeah. this is a razor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, work. Uh, one second. All I gotta do is uh. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Eddie uh, Winstead. I work for ISC. Um, you may know us as uh, well. Okay, you may know us as uh, the authors and maintainers of Bind DNS software. Hello, Mr. Houston. Uh, we're also also one of the operators of um, 
uh, one of the root servers. We operate fruit. Um, so my talk today is on running a local copy of the DNS root zone. Now, uh, I want to preface this with um, this isn't necessarily a suggestion. Uh, this is more of some people are doing this. And I'd like to actually solicit some of your feedback. Are any of you doing this? And if you are, what have you, been your results? Um, or have any of you done this and then regretted doing so? <laughs> so. All right, so uh, a little bit on this, you know, this. We talk about this Internet of Things all the time now, right? Um, so um, the reason that this talk sort of got started is this October, I think it was October 21st of 2016, uh, there was what's considered to be the largest attack ever uh, on Dyn's DNS infrastructure. Um, now, I want to be very clear that I'm not into, uh, let's see, how do I say this? Um, Dyn has really excellent infrastructure. Okay, so let's not blame the victim, right? So um, this is just the state of things as we find ourselves in the, the growth of the internet, right? So I don't think many of us envisioned, you know, 30 years ago that there'd be millions of these devices sitting out there that we could trick into asking questions of valid infrastructure. But that's where we find ourselves today. Um, so a little bit of good news, bad news. The good news is I was affected by this attack. I don't, is that good news? I was affected by this attack personally. Okay, so this attack was only visible, uh, and this is the other thing I'll say, like in Dyn's defense, um, they were really transparent about how, um, as, as, they, as much as they could be about how they defended against this and what the impact was. Um, but some of the news outlets sort of blew it, blew it out of proportion. The only people that were affected were on the east coast of the US. Now that's a lot of folks, right? Um, so back to the good news, I was one of them. Okay, so I'm sitting there in my home and, um, you know, surfing the web or whatever, and suddenly certain sites that I'm visiting, I can't get to, okay? Uh, my boss is in the room, so I can't say which sites those were, and it's during work hours, so. <laughs> but anyway, so me as a user, I'm trying to look up DNS names, and suddenly I'm not getting a response. Now, what this looks like to the general user is, oh, I can't get to such website, you know, because to a lot of the general public, the internet is websites. Um, so for me, in that case, there was like, okay, I can't get to that site. Um, my first response is always, well, my provider is having another problem, right? Um, but wait, I can get to these other sites. And so then I start to query, well, okay, hmm, it turns out, all of these sites that I'm having a problem with, the authoritative servers are dying. Um, so it's very interesting to see it from that perspective. Uh, so again, the, the attack was, um, in terms of who it affected user-wise, was on the east coast of the US. Um, we could not get to the site, some of the sites of, that Dyne provides DNS for authoritatively. Um, so again, I want to stress, though, that Dyn has, uh, I mean, we know those guys, right? Dyn has really, really good, well-designed infrastructure. This isn't um, an attack that was pulled off against someone that we know's infrastructure isn't great, right? Uh, let's see. Oh, let me close this thing. Sorry. Okay. Well, when I do that, it doesn't play, does it? Okay. Well, full screen. Is that better? Okay. Uh, and again, I'll state with DDoS, you know, I mean, this was an attack against Dyn's infrastructure, but, uh, you know, in this case, I was a victim. Uh, lots of people along the U.S. East Coast, were, you know, the whole thing is blurred, right? Um, so all of us are affected by this. I mean, in general, everyone in this room, to some degree, our job is to keep this internet thing going, right? That's why we're all here. Um, we've grown the internet from what it was, uh, and the, the thing now is to keep it operating and keep it growing. So uh, I also want to point out that the reason this topic came up at ISC is twofold, right? So we are uh, one of the root server operators. So of course, we're, when we see a, suc a somewhat successful attack against well-architected uh, infrastructure, it concerns us, right? Especially of the size that it was. Um, so we look at it from that perspective, and then also we as um, makers of DNS software uh, 
think of, try to think about these things of what could we have done differently? What can we do differently with the software um, to make this have less of an impact on, uh, back to my example, me, all right? Oh, I gave you the good news. The bad news is, um, so I'm still on US East Coast time, so I gave a really great version of this talk about 10 hours ago in my hotel room. <laughs> no one else was there, unfortunately, but anyway. All right, so back to the root server system. Um, so uh, I, 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 I'm sensitive to the fact that I, I don't want folks to take this as an alarm bell that the root server system is vulnerable. Okay, so there's a lot of work that goes into make, ensuring that root service, root DNS service is maintained. Uh, now the roots, the root servers are certainly uh, a very uh, high value target and people like to try to take down the root servers. Okay, so there's certainly been events that um, have caused root, uh, let's, what's the right word? Disturbance, but so far not an outage, okay? So I don't want you to. I don't want. You, I don't want to raise alarms with this talk. Um, the other part is, you, if you'll notice, that some of the customers that were dying only, one of their responses was, after this event, they suddenly had some other authoritative name servers that weren't run by Dyne. Um, and again, that's not a knock on Dyne. What that is is saying, well, one of the ways that we can defend against this kind of thing is by having diverse uh, infrastructure both organizationally and network, geographic, et cetera, et cetera. So if you think about the root server system, we sort of have that already. There's 12 operators of the 13 root servers. VeriSign runs two of the letters. Um, so this organizational diversity and the, 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 the infrastructure diversity and the ways that each letter defends against attacks uh, is very critical to ensuring root service. So all that's great. Uh, but again, the root servers are uh, very, um, does anyone remember Anonymous announced like two years ago that they were going to take down the root server system? Yeah? Okay. Uh, that was very concerning for us, of course, as one of the root operators. Um, it turns out they didn't do it. Um, we don't even know that they tried. But anyway, it, it was a public threat. So, I mean, people think about this thing. Um, so it, this le leads us to this question, you know, uh, what, what are the ways that this could have been handled better for, again, back to my example, I'm sitting in my home, how could that have been handled better for me, okay? So just, just assume that I'm sitting there and I'm using my ISP's name server, okay? What could that name server have done to, in, in terms of if this was an attack on the root, okay? So stepping away from the dying example, this is saying, if that same effect had happened, but at the root level, okay? What could have been done? So one of the things that sort of came to our mind almost immediately, and this, a lot of this work was done by Ray Bellis that a lot of you know, uh, and I, he's a research fellow at ISC. Um, well, we kept coming back to, well, this has been thought about before, but for different reasons. And uh, this was in RFC 7706. Um, people thought about doing the, running a local copy of the root for the reason of, my round trip times to the root servers are really slow, so maybe how can I improve that? Well, I could run a, a local copy. Then there's this other thing, you know, when you query, so if I run a query for www.apricot2017.net, if I'm asking a resolver that doesn't have a cache built up, then that whole query gets asked of a root server somewhere. Um, and so some people are a little freaked out that your DNS question gets asked somewhere that you might not think it ought to be. And then there's all these paths that it has to traverse and, and whatnot. So anyway, RFC 7706, these were the concerns that they were trying to address. So we sort of thought about this as like, well, this is another way that we could use the techniques in that RFC to provide service so that you wouldn't have a massive outage as experienced in the Dyn attack if there was the same success against the root server system. Okay? All right. So here are our technical options. And I also want to uh, point out with RFC 7706, there are providers out there that are doing this already. Um, so again, if there's anyone in the room that's doing it, we'd, I'd like to hear from you. If you can't say it publicly, check, you know, talk with me afterwards. I'd like to hear what your experience has been. All right, well, the technical options, um, 
There's a few more than this, but these are the only ones I really felt comfortable presenting. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can do some crazy things with the DNS. Uh, in general, don't do that, right? So um, the first one I'm going to go ahead and tell you, don't do that, okay? It is 2017. Um, DNSSEC has sort of been around for a little bit. You know, let's not do this. But we know that people still haven't turned on DNSSEC validation. So there's a way that you could achieve this goal um, without deploying DNSSEC at this point, if you haven't yet in 2017. Please do. All right. So uh, I, I do want to say this. So uh, I mentioned that I, you know, I work for ISC. The examples I'm going to show are bind related. And the reason they're bind related is bind has sort of the unique um, feature. You can call it what you like. Uh, we can do authoritative and recursive in the same piece of software. Um, there are pros and cons to that. Some people like that. Some people don't like that. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is I'm going to show you examples from Bind because it's easier in the slide set. Um, but you can do this. This is, this is name server software agnostic. You can do this. You can, you can run a local copy of the root zone with whatever name server software that you're using. Okay. Uh, I also should point out that um, I say configs heavily borrowed from, R they were actually stolen from RFC 7706. I've talked to Warren about this afterwards, but anyway. If you want to see configs for these other types of software, um, you can always refer to that RFC because they're in there. Okay. All right. Some things I want to point out uh, right from the start is uh, you're, if you do this, of course, if you're going to run a local copy, it means you're going to have to zone transfer. Okay. You're going to have to take in the root zone. Okay. To most of us, that's not a big deal, um, but it is something to think about. The root gets updated at least once a day, and currently that entire zone transfer is 1.25 megabytes. Um, also note that not all root servers permit zone transfers. And I should also add, some, if those of you that are DNS operators will know there's um, AXFR and IXFR. So AXFR gives me all the zone, IXFR gives me incremental. You can't do the incremental transfers with the root zone. So you have to get it all, and you have to do that at least once a day. Okay. Um, Back to uh, RFC 7706, if you want to know what root servers actually accept zone transfers, it's listed in that RFC as well. So if you want to do this, you can refer to that RFC. So here, um, I'm going to show you the first option. And again, this is one that I, you know, um, I don't want you to do, but I'm going to show it anyway. Um, so here, we're saying for we're going to have zone root. And it's, we're going to be a slave server for that. So essentially, we're becoming authoritative for the root zone, right? Um, we don't, we're going to store it in this file. We don't want to notify anyone if our data changes because we're not really authoritative for I mean, we are. We're authoritative for it, but we're not in delegation, so to speak. And it's not even delegation because it's at the top. But anyway, um, you don't want to notify any other servers if your data changes, right? And then here we have a list of master servers where we're going to get the actual authoritative data from. Okay? Fairly simple to do this. So some things to think about. Um, if you do this, then suddenly that www.apricot2017.net query that I was telling you about, that's going to come back with a referral, but everything is going to be in... Uh, everything's going to have the authoritative bit set, right? Because you now are authoritative for root. Now, in the example that I gave as far as me sitting at home, with, uh, being a normal client, that should not have any effect. And we don't know of any cases where this would cause any problem, okay? Um, that doesn't mean they don't exist. We don't know of them. Um, so again, you can do this simply. And the problem being, though, is that uh, you're still not taking advantage of deploying DNSSEC. All right. So now if we did this on the resolver itself, uh, but we want to do it with DNSSEC, this is, the way, this is the way we could do it. And again, this is the stuff stolen right out of RFC 7706. So now I have uh, a view root. I'll talk about views in a second. But we're going to have a root view. Uh, we're going to match the destinations. In this case, this is sort of a, uh, it's a local address, obviously, on the server. Um, we're going to slave the zone just like we did before. All that looks about the same for the rest of the stanzas. And then we're going to also have a recursive view. 
And we're gonna say, we're gonna do DNSSEC validation auto. That means we're gonna use the built-in DNSSEC root keys, that's great. Um, we're going to allow recursion from anyone because for this view, we're doing recursion on behalf of our clients. Um, and we're gonna serve up root as a static stub zone and we're gonna get the, uh, the server addresses for this zone data exist at this IP address. Okay, this is essentially saying if you match this view, get data for the root from my locally stored copy. This is what we're trying to achieve, okay? All right, this sounds great to everyone? Yeah? Well, why did you have to, <laughs> why did you do, why did you have to do views to me, right? Okay, so views are another one of those uh, you love them or you hate them kind of things. Um, but views do add, they do add complexity to your configuration. So if you're not already doing views, you probably don't want to do this, right? <laughs> uh, and as a matter of fact, I would not recommend this to be your first introduction to views, okay? Um, don't do that. So, but why? Why do we have to do this, okay? Why can't I just have a local copy of the root zone and do recursive services to my clients? All that should be fine. Well. If you think about this, if, those of you that are, are DNSSEC folks, um, you can't query a DNSSEC, uh, an authoritative DNSSEC server and validate that data from that server. You can't, that server cannot validate its own data. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? So in the same way, I, if I'm sitting on Resolver and I'm authoritative for a zone, I can't validate my own data. That's not how it works, okay? So the, the, the RFC says this very, uh, very well. Um, we use separate views because the DS records uh, will then be validated as we access, access the zone data from the recursive server. So if I'm using the same view or I don't do views at all, then I can't validate. I can't validate my own data, okay? All right, um, this is, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and let you know on a secret. If you wanna do this, this is the one that I suggest. Um, I, I really recommend that you do this off Resolver um, and of course with DNSSEC. So let's just run through the technical parts and then we'll talk about why, it's, why I think it's best to do that. Um, so you would run additional name servers. Okay, this, is, um, this, is, this may or may not be a problem for you. If you're a large provider and you have ways to, we just saw a nice presentation on salt and napalm. If you can fire up servers really easily, then why not do this, right? So if you already have that infrastructure in place, this is really good. Um, so fire up some new boxes. Um, if you, your, author, your authoritative config will then just be like in slide number eight. So we're gonna do that on this new server. And I recommend you do it on servers, a couple of different ones, right? So we have that, that was our simple config. We don't have any views going on now. Um, so again, that config was done on these new authoritative servers. On the resolver side, what we're gonna do is essentially take the little piece that we had in the, the recursive view from the prior example, and we're gonna do that on these um, recursive servers, all right? Uh, one thing I did note that I probably should not have used the word forward. Uh, what we're trying to say here is we're gonna use this config to make sure that the the root queries get answered at those servers. Okay, forwarding has its own connotations in DNS speak, right? Uh, so send is a better term here. Uh, so root, static sub again, and then the server addresses will just be the addresses that of the new servers that we create, okay? So the reason uh, that I like this, and generally it's the consensus within ISC is, um, we, we have, we're preserving our best practice, so we're separating the authoritative and recursive functions. All that's good. Um, I don't have to introduce further complexity with views. Again, if you're not doing views, don't do this as the first chance. Um, the, the drawback is you are gonna have to have additional name servers. Okay, and again, for some folks, that means a lot. For some people, that's, it's pretty easy to do, right? All right, so uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I really want to stress that um, if you don't have consistently well-working authoritative or consistently well-working recursive servers, don't try to fix this problem with these techniques. Get those problems fixed first, right? Uh, again, the root server system is, is very resilient, 
has been proven to be very resilient in the face of attacks. So we're hoping that we never have to make use of this for, uh, for, for this reason. Um, but, you know, this does introduce some complexity into your environment. And um, you will need to know things like, well, if you're debugging a problem that you have a local copy of the root running, okay? Because obviously where your query flows are going will be much different. Um, that's what I said earlier, okay? Uh, I do wanna say one other thing um, that's not on the slides, but what we've, we've been considering is, back to the example of me sitting at home and if I couldn't, and this actually works for the Dyn example as well, one of the things that we're considering software-wise and the other vendors are as well is this sort of idea of TTL extension. So um, when we've done work in the past, we've, we've done some stuff like, does everyone remember the lovely uh, pseudo random subdomain and how much pain they caused us like two or three years ago, right? Uh, we started doing things where we could detect if authoritative servers weren't answering. And we could do things like stop asking them so many questions. So it's sort of the same concept is that if the authoritative servers are no longer answering, if I have data in my cache, since I've detected that something is wrong with those authoritative servers, can I just extend that TTL? Now, there's obviously a little controversy with that sort of proposed technique, so, uh, but that is one of the things that is being considered and um, proposed by various folks. And with that, I'll take some time for questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. I, I knew Mr. Houston would have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, please. So this technique, in effect, arms a recursive resolver with knowledge of the entire root zone for the TTL period. Yes, th that is important to point and out. And yes. does a full zone transfer yeah. each TTL expiration. The discussion in the IETF also produced a different technique called aggressive insect caching, okay. where in essence what you do is every time you get back an NX domain response, mm -hmm. you cache the range of names covered by NSEC and effectively authoritatively answer mm -hmm. for all names in that NSEC described range. The advantage is it's not just the root. Right. It it's, applies it's to any signed yeah. domain where the recursive resolver can authoritatively answer bogus queries yeah. inside a conventional TTL, and it doesn't rely on a huge zone transfer. So as a technique for offloading queries, it has very similar properties to this, mm -hmm. but slightly more general generality and potentially slightly less overhead. So my question. Yes. It's in not. Okay. But I don't think it's in bind. It's not. When are we going to see it, it is, in bind? It is cannot. That is the question. <laughs> when is this coming in bind? It is cannot in bind. Uh, I don't have an answer for you right Damn. away. Damn. And you knew that, but no, I will. No, I didn't. I was hopeful. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't have an answer for you. So, But um, I don't know. I'll, I'll attempt to get one for you, though. You, you so, see, let me just, just go one step further. Mm -hmm. I believe it could be a one-liner in the config in the same way as it's, you know, DNSSEC validation equals yes. Aggressive right. NSEC use equals yes is about all it would oh, take. That's a, that's a very valid... So it's kind of a really no-brainer for recursive yeah. resolvers to simply hang on to those NSEC records. They're going to hang on to them anyway, mm -hmm. but reuse them for the full range of queries. Yeah. So, you know, it was a question that really does have a, you know, I'd love to see this in bind. So okay. it's, a, it's a strong suggestion aimed at you. Oh, oh I uh, taken, and I really like the idea of having a config option as well. Because then, for us, that becomes easier to implement. Because if people don't want it, they don't have to turn it on. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah, and uh, another point that Jeff brought up that I, I failed to mention earlier is that... Um, as I mentioned, you, it, this does require zone transfers. So if you're in the authoritative DNS business already, you, ha you should have checks to make sure zone data is still valid. So you want to have things in place that 
will let you know if zone transfers don't work, if a zone is nearing expiration, uh, if you were unable to get a zone transfer, these various things. Good. Any other question? Uh, last thing I'll say is I'm really excited about uh, my friends at JPRS and Kyushu Telecom because this is, well, this is sort of a, it's a very related topic. It's yeah. just, it's one level down it what is, they're going to yeah. talk about. So I'm excited. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So let's invite uh, the, the third uh, speakers. Uh, we have uh, Noguchi-san and uh, Suematsu-san. So they will talk about any cast technique to deploy TLD name servers in ISP. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I'm Shoji Noguchi, a system software engineer at JPRS. I and I'm uh, the uh, project leader for .JPRS R&D activities. Let me introduce uh, my agenda. Uh, here is what I'm going to talk about in my presentation, and I have divided my speech into five parts. First, I introduce the concept of .jpr TLD. Second, I'll, I'll explain about the background of joint research and the reason why we decided to select it as a research, joint research project. Third, I'll explain about the overview of this activity. Fourth, i explain about the, our activity report from the viewpoint of our registry operator. At the end, the co-presenter, uh, who is my colleague, Mr. Yoshibumi of QTNet. He will explain about the activity report from the viewpoint of uh, an ISP. <laughs> let me introduce a brief, uh, let me start by a brief introduction of .jprs. The JPRs is uh, one of the new GTLDs, and I have, uh, no, uh, JPRs have been a register operator since July 2015. In order for the, the internet to keep growing, uh, JPRs as a register operator will require an environment in which to create positive innovation. For this reason, JPRS have decided to create experimental TLD for domain names and DNS. I explained the background of our R&D activities and the reasons why we have decided to use the environment for the joint research. Japan suffered from various and many natural disasters. Last year, there was a large earthquake in Kumamoto, one of prefectures in the Kyushu region of Japan. It is difficult to detect where, where and when uh, will, uh, the earthquake will hit Japan. So in, under, that con uh, sorry, under such conditions, we must provide uh, we must consider the importance of being prepared for natural disasters. Please re look at this picture. This picture shows you uh, the map of Japan, overlapping the 
Southeast Asia, giving you the size, giving you the sense of its size. It's surprisingly, Japan is an unexpectedly large land. Such geographical features do, do not always pose potential danger to all regions of Japan, but specific regions in many cases. Let me introduce the Japanese futures from different view, point of view. Most, if not all, of the internet resources are concentrated in Tokyo and Osaka, uh, such as internet exchanges, transit connections, data centers, and so on. For this reason, natural disasters that may occur in or around Tokyo or Osaka uh, hmm? oh. can affect the concentrated internet resources and internet connectivity. Considering such physical and logical features of Japan, we need to uh, we need to find a way to enhance the DNS resiliency. One of the suggested resolution is the location of DNS servers. We have this uh, suggest we have been suggesting to install DNS servers in several regions other than Tokyo and Osaka. Uh, this way. Even if the DNS servers in a particular region are down or unable to serve, we, can, we will be able to continue providing DNS and internet services. The JPL server consists of five host names. TLD1 and 4 are in Tokyo, and TLD2 is in Osaka. There, these three out of five DNS servers have been operated by JPRS. We have been successfully recruiting eight domestic regional ISP participants for joint research project. Their service areas are identical with the regions of Japan. We have decided to install the JPR DNS servers TLD4 into their networks as local nodes. We have this suggested to ISPs to direct DNS query to local node. We have suggested two methods to ISPs to direct DNS query to local node. Uh, one. The routing configuration represents the method of using routing protocol, or BZP. The full configuration represents the method of forcing DNS queries to go to a specified IP addresses. This slide shows your measurement environment model. We have installed local node into ISP's network, and ISP prepared three types of servers. Uh, a .jprs secondary application server provides web and DNS services. A stub resolver generates web and DNS queries uh, to secondary application servers. A full resolver receives uh, DNS queries. Uh, which is issued by stub resolver and, and send authoritative DNS servers. This table shows RSP use routing or full resolver configuration and DNS software version by, uh, by each ISP of the intention and adoption uh, configuration and uh, the software versions are different. We have created a scenario. Uh, 
sorry, I have created two, uh, we have created a scenario to evaluate the internet service availability and the reachability of .jpr DNS servers. One is under the condition before installing local node. And the other is under the condition after installing local node. These two, uh, under, under these two measurement conditions, we have attempted to compare the traffic behavior by turning on and off internet connection. We will call the traffic with internet connection the normal state, and the traffic without internet connection simulating the state of disaster. We have, uh, in the first result, we, have, we confirmed the reachability of .jprs DNS, DNS servers. This graph represents the number of times that DNS queries uh, have been sent to uh, have been sent to have have been sent by uh, full resolvers to the JPR DNS servers. The right of right part of the graph represents the state when the internet was turned on. The right of over right the right part of the graph represents the state when the internet connection was turned off. If you look like this graph closely, you will find that destination of .jpr DNS queries from the res resolver had inclined to towards local node on their ISP network. Uh, now, we would like to talk about our findings in consideration of, of in consideration of the measurement result. This pie chart represents the distribution ratio by destination of DNS query uh, originated from ISPs Florizova to .jprs DNS servers. Approximately 75% of the total DNS queries have sent have been sent to the JPRS DNS server in both Tokyo and Osaka. We once again realized that DNS queries to Tokyo and Osaka were over concentrated. This pie chart represents the distribution ratio by uh, under the condition the combination of the combination with disaster and with local node this uh, approximately 91% of the total dns queries have sent to local node however 5% uh, of the total dns queries uh, have been sent to both .jpl servers in both Tokyo and Osaka. We have we assume that the event was affected by NS selection algorithm in bind. From now on, I will talk about the changes in the RTT over DNS query at the stub resolver. We compared between BZP and static stub methods. Five ISPs selected BGP as a method to install local node. The standard deviation of RTT affected by loss in the disaster was larger than in normal by four to 10, past 10 times. Three ISPs selected uh, static stuff 
as a method to install local node. Static stub is a function provided by bind nine. This function allows a recursive name server to force DNS queries for a particular zone to go to specified IP addresses. The st standard deviation of RTT uh, almost unchanged between normal and disaster. Moreover, the standard deviation of static stub was smaller than that of BGP by two to eight times. Summarizing the above, in a particular static stub, DNS query inclined toward a destination with a shorter RTT. However, it depends on how we use either or both of BGP and static stub. This slide shows second findings, uh, behavior of static stub. The RTT of Enecom was shorter than that of ATNet. We confirm the trend of these DNS queries. As a trend in Enecom, one DNS query has sent to all .jpr's DNS servers only once a day at their AM, and, the, and all the other DNS queries have been sent to local nodes. On the other hand, as a trend in HDNet, several DNS queries to all .jpr servers are every six hours, and all the other DNS queries have been sent to local nodes. We assume that the difference is a load balancing algorithm. In the end of result, all eight ISPs were able to continue offering their internet service by installing local node inside their own network, even during the internet was turned off. This slide is show future work, our future works relating this activity. The one is, one of the, our future works will be share ISP's local node among themselves. The other future work will be evaluate geographical dispersal of DNS. Now we move on to the next section. The presenter is my who the presenter who is my colleague is Mr. Yoshibumi. Good morning, everyone. Let me uh, next. I will introduce the collaborate project with JPRS. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Yoshibumi Sematz, an engineer of QtNet. I talk about firstly uh, background, secondary the result by setting the local node, and finally uh, conclusion of the project and future work. Kyushu Telecommunication Network, commonly known as QtNet. QtNet provides service is FTTH, VoIP, and TV service. Kyushu is one of the eight regions of Japan. I explain background of participation. Internet connectivity, Japan concentrates in Tokyo and Osaka. This network, Kyushu, depends on this area. What are problems? If the large disasters simultaneously hit in around Tokyo and Osaka, Isolated from other regions of Japan. Cannot provide our internet service in Kyushu. The 
Do I think to seriously? No. I think it's possible situation. Last year, the large disasters has occurred in Kyushu. In this time, these were large quake many, many times. Right figure indicate DNS query received at full uh, FTTH full resolver. This means that query was received many times. In any station was uh, in any station we must provide our customers with our internet service. This picture indicates scale of this earthquake. The maze is very heavy. Part of mountain crumbles down. A large bridge is broken. Qtnet do recover effort to recover to communication around the clock. Background. The advantage of using .jprs. .jprs registry operator is same as uh, .jp, which is CCTLD for Japan. Ratio DNS query uh, of by TLD in our FTTH service. Right figure indicate uh, TLD ranking of requests for DNS query. This means .jp is second place. There are many DNS query for .jp. Many important customers have used .jp. TLD Anycast DNS server to QtNet. Right table, right table indicate our process. This downside, downside uh, figure indicate number of query to dot JPRS DNS. Number one state has uh, connect connectivity or not. In two and three state, global nodes are disconnected uh, gradually. Now, in number four state, all global nodes disconnected. Nevertheless, are show as blue area. The connectivity is maintained by local node. As an interesting result by setting local node to uh, QtNet. Uh, left figure re responsive number of RTT and hop to each dot JPRS DNS. Look at uh, red curve. This means uh, the number of RTT and hop to small and shorter. Right figure indicate number of DNS query to each dot JPRS DNS. After installing local node, blue area becomes large. And from this result, when the local node is installed, RTT becomes small and bind select with small RTT. Conclusion. Installing TLD Anycast DNS server in QtNet. 
their mean insulating local node is effective both in normal times and in large scale disasters. Future works. To install .jp local node in Kyushu. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. So, any question, uh, comment? <coughs> you can make a question in Japanese or English, I think. If you can. <laughs> in Japanese. <laughs> if not, then thank you very much. Thank you. So, it's the uh, ending of this uh, uh, network operation session. So, now we are going to lunch break. And then the afternoon session will start from 2 p.m. Thank you for the uh, uh, coming here, participation, and see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh,